I can, I can, I can look. So let's get, I just, I'm not going to cut it. Okay. Well, maybe you'll grow into that. All right, folks. We're going to talk about spiders. Let's just lay it on out there. No, I am anti spider. So my mom used to live in Texas. And see, now I can't remember if it was scorpion or tarantula, but they would put whatever one of those on a stick, like, just like a marshmallow, and they'd roast it in the fire and they'd eat it. Oh. And she's like, mmm. <laughs> yeah, this is a real thing. So back when I was a kid, this movie came out called Arachnophobia, which means like fear of spiders. Has anyone seen it? Yeah, I've heard of it. Okay, so at the time it seemed like it was pretty legit, but now you look at it and laugh because it looks like huge, well, it is large hairy robot that's walking around scaring the guy from Dumb and Dumber. Do you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. But at the time, it was really terrifying. So anyhow, so Arachnids, that movie. they probably could remake it. All right, give me the most obvious thing about spiders. How many legs do they have? Okay, yes, sir. So four pairs of legs. So usually when we look at arthropods, don't talk over me, especially because I'm recording. When we look at arthropods, I do this because it makes me think jointed legs. What we're going to see is either a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, or these two are going to be in one cephalothorax and abdomen. So for a spider, visualize a spider crawling across your room, trying to climb up in your bed. What do you see? Do you see a head, thorax, and abdomen, or do you see a cephalothorax and abdomen? Oh, I see a boot. <laughs> you see a boot. What do you see? I see a cephalothorax. So it only has two of those body segments because this is fused together. All right. Another thing that's interesting about spiders is. Have you guys ever done anything like a go to the science museum or maybe you saw a video how a fly sees like what it looks like through yes. a fly's eyes what does it look like through a fly's eyes it's like a, a fly it's all mirrored and perfect that's a perfect word and i couldn't think of it earlier so it's like a kaleidoscope you know how it it, it breaks everything into smaller pictures you know the thing you used to put on your eye and you would twist it like this and had like little greens and reds and yellow crystals what how do you even spell it? He didn't have a child, but well, he doesn't know what a kaleidoscope is. He said, tell me about it. All right. So a fly has compound eyes. It's like watching 100 TVs at the same time. Okay. But a spider has... But a spider does not have compound eyes where there's multiple lenses and you're seeing like everything a gajillion times. Spider is like looking through a straw, which if I'm looking through a straw, what does that do to my, my vision? Tell me what that does. Tunnel vision. So if someone came in the door with my normal human eyes, I could literally avert my eyes and hardly even move my head. And I would be like, oh, hey, what's up? But if I'm a spider, I am gonna have to literally go, huh? And like look over so like you can imagine a spider like when you're just like like looking over at you so usually it has four pairs of simple eyes so those are called simple eyes and so next to simple eyes i'm just going to write straw you should totally go home and put a straw on your eye and try to see what it looks like to look through it oh in on well in your eye either doesn't sound pleasant. All right. Do spiders have antennae? No. no. Okay, so no antennae. So how do they feel now? They have hairy legs a lot of times. Yeah. What about breathing for a spider? So we looked at the crawfish had gills and we're going to do that dissection next week. And this is one of those things that whenever I study something, most of the time I'm like, why couldn't the name of it make me think of what the thing does. But this is one of the times in science it actually makes sense. If you literally go into a spider's body, you will see, it looks like pages of a book, just like this, layers of tissue side by side by side, and it uses it to extract oxygen from the air. Because if it was just like one tissue, you only have that much space to absorb oxygen. But what if you had all those tissues? 
So these are called book lungs. It's how they breathe. And the word for breathe is respiration. All right. What is something creative that spiders can do? Make a web. They can make webs. So like worst thing ever is you're walking and you all of a sudden walk through the spider web. It's terrifying. <laughs> well, and see, I always think, have you ever seen the big greenish yellow garden spider? That I always am like, it must be on that web I walk through. And I, I mean, I'm just like, like <laughs> freaking out. So they can do like um, uh, funnel webs. They can do orb webs. I mean, it's actually really interesting, but what actually makes the web material? Do you remember from any of the readings? So so they have silk glands, but we call them spinnerets. And it's near their backside. And this is what makes the web. So those silk glands are constantly making the silk and the spinneret is what's actually weaving it and creating the actual spider web. It's near its backside. And then finally, what about how it eats? How does a spider, what does it do to its food? How does that work? Tell me everything. What you think? Um, some of them inject poison or digestive fluids. Perfect. So they inject. So they they do their. They inject either poison from a poison gland or digestive enzymes, which you have in your spit. Digestive enzymes break things down. So if I'm a spider, kind of like a um, fungus, I'm going to actually put the digestive enzymes, let's say the spider's trying to eat an insect, okay? He's gonna put the digestive enzymes into that insect so it's digesting outside of the body and then the spider's then gonna take up the digested insect. So it has poison glands and digestive enzymes. Digestive insect look like? Insect? Say it one more time. What does a digested insect look like? What does a digested inside look like? Insect. Oh. Almost like an insect. I would just say it looks like a pile of goo. Oh, and then they slurp it up. Yeah. I hate that word. Slurp, slurp it up. <laughs> okay. We're going to do a quick timeout because what you guys are going to do, take one and pass it around. I filled out the answers to one of these. It might just be here. Just take one and pass it around. I hope I've been up. So we're going to watch this video. It's the top 10 most venomous spiders. And you're going to fill it out for a quiz grade. As we go, I'll make sure I press pause if you feel like you, you missed an answer and I'll help you find the answer if you missed that as well. But we're gonna learn all about how aggressive they are, how big they are, what does their bite cause? The guy says the word death at least a hundred times in the video. It can cause death. Let's see if we have enough. I'm worried about this. Oh, I have enough, don't I? Do I, do I? Do I? Yes, yes, no, no, yes, no. Look at that. Wait, do you want us to start with number one or number 10? Okay, so it's starting with number 10 and it's oh. it's like building up oh, so to the, the there you go. All right. Oh, that's the Sydney funnel leverage. Oh my gosh, as soon as I, I saw the YouTube, I was like, no, I, I know. Videos, I mean, please, will. Purpose you do study, not. But, um, you love studying about Stuff. Well, I don't like that he gets stung by something called the science. Uh -huh. You should see him when he got in close contact with that. that was very loud. With a Gila monster. Yeah. And it bit him and it's crazy. And they're studying them for like a it has something in it that can they think can help cure diabetes. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, there's a guy that I saw. There's a guy I saw that he has probably 50 snakes and he lets them each bite him a little bit each day. So he's building up like this tolerance to each of their venoms and his arms are absolutely covered. Okay. So what we're going to do is watch this. Here's the worst part about this. There's like four times that a commercial comes on about a dog show and it's really irritating, but we'll just, we can live with it because it's actually, and you're probably not gonna be able to see it from where you're sitting, which if you care, you can move. Otherwise you can hear it. Okay. So I'm going to press play. You're never that far away from a spider. However, there are so many different spider species, approximately 40,000 worldwide, that it's hard to figure out which one. So, like, hold it. 
ones you really need to worry about and which ones are harmless. Today we're going to be looking at 10 of the most venomous spiders in the world. Make sure you watch out for number one because not only is it the most venomous spider in the world, one could be lurking in your house. Let's begin, shall we? Number 10. The Red-Legged Widow. The Red-Legged Widow is a very rare spider, which is a member of the Black Widow family and highly venomous. According to all literature, this spider is indigenous to South and Central Florida. This colorful spider is less than an inch long, but packs the same type of venom as its other widow relatives. So you guys have a chance so far? Yep. Let me have the extra one. I did one. Did someone get mine that, oh, I haven't tried to put it in the first place. In the first box. <laughs> I mean, I was taking it. Okay, so indigenous to South Florida, about an inch long. Um, it's physical description. It sports a red-orange cephalothorax. Its abdomen is black with yellow rings outlining the rows of red spots, and its legs are vermilion red. So a red-orange cephalothorax and then a black abdomen. Neil, do you ever notice that the spider names usually have three or four words in it? That's a Northern funnel, funnel West Spider, Sydney Funnel West Spider. Really it kind of resembles a ladybug, though. So now we're going to learn about the symptoms of the bite. On its underside, it does not have the familiar hourglass marking and instead usually has one or two small red marks. And like with all spiders, females are almost double the size of the male. The good news is this spider is so rare that encounters with humans very seldom happens. But when bites do happen, they are not very pleasant. Bite systems are systemic, spreading through the lymphatic system and usually starts about one to three hours after the bite. The most common symptoms are intense pain, rigid abdominal muscles, muscle cramping, malaise, local sweating, nausea, vomiting, and hypertension. So what it actually does, the way that the venom works, I'll tell you, intense pain, rigid abdominal pain, nausea, sweating, I forget the what else you said, but... What's interesting is it actually affects the ion channels that make your muscles contract. So it forces your abdominal muscles into a contraction. The venom does. So imagine like when you do a sit up, well, I don't, I don't ever have muscle contraction, right? But if I did and you're just stuck in it, like, like that, that's what it would be like. Ooh, how do you spell nausea? N-A-U-S-E-A. Oh, E-A. And no one can be nauseous. You can be nauseated. Wait, 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 you can't be nauseous? You can't say I'm nauseous. What? I'm not nauseous, I'm nauseated. Oh, I have always said that. <laughs> nauseated okay. sounds worse. These are the things that will matter in the future. <laughs> okay, ready? If left untreated, these bite symptoms usually last from three to five days. Number nine, the wolf spider. The wolf spider is a member of the Lycosidae family, and there are around 125 species found in the U.S. and about 50 species found in Europe. How many species are there? 125 in the U.S., 50 in Europe. So how many? 175. Math. To me, the very thought that I live on a planet with 175 different species oh, of wolf spider. spider is a problem. Okay? <laughs> but my neighbor is a big fan of the wolf spider because it really does help keep any other spiders and insects from living in your home. So if she finds one, she actually catches it and lets it go in her house. No. Yes, oh, she does. That thing. Yes, no. she does. Oh, oh, I would my never neighbor. be in her house. Uh -uh, I've never just sit in her house. What if in the bed? Oh my gosh. Well, they don't like the bed as much in the ground when Felicia does, which P.S. If you drop your blanket on the floor, don't you just grab it and cover yourself. You gotta shake it out, because that's where brown fleece is like to be. Also, that's what those bumps on my leg are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also, if you leave your jeans on the ground and you're like, oh, I'm gonna wear those. When you pick them up, shake them out. I still do that. I do that. I take them well, I did that with the 
That's why people like from the north when they see southerners, I'm sure they're like, why do they shake everything out before they leave? Because we don't want to get brown wolf food spikes. Okay. A full grown wolf spider is typically a half an inch to two inches in length. They are hairy and are usually brown or gray with various stripe like markings on their backs. They received the name wolf spider due to an early belief that the spiders would actually hunt their prey in a group. So they're hairy, brown and gray, they can have stripe markings on their back. Just get something. Don't get up, don't go crazy trying to get it word for word, okay? How did they get their name, Wolf Spider? They thought they, hunt in groups. they thought that they hunted in groups like wolves did. They really thought they were all like, did they not? Guys, let's go get it. That's <laughs> not, but that's not how it works. Oh, well, then why did they think that? Uh, I always thought from their like appearance. Because they kind of look like yeah. wolves. Yeah. Okay, what's another name that it's named by? Some other names for the wolf spider are the ground spider and the hunting spider. Unlike most spiders, wolf spiders do not make webs but actively hunt for their prey. Even though the wolf spider is poisonous, its venom is not lethal. This spider is not known to be aggressive, however, they will bite if they feel like they're in harm or danger. If bitten by a wolf spider, the wound should not be bandaged, but an ice pack should be placed on the bite to reduce swelling. If necessary, the victim should avoid any movement or increased heart rate, because it is extremely important to see medical attention if bitten by a wolf spider. Number eight, the Sydney Funnel Web Spider. This Eastern Australian native spider is one of the most feared of the venomous animals down under. They're typically one to three inches long and can be very aggressive when provoked. The long-lived female funnel webs spend most of their time in their silk-lined tubular burrow retreats. The males tend to wander during the warmer months of the year looking for receptive females. The Sydney Funnel Web Spider is responsible for 13 confirmed deaths between 1927 and 1980. The Sydney Funnel Web Spider venom contains a compound known as atracotoxin, a highly toxic ion channel inhibitor. These spiders typically deliver a full envenomation when they bite, often striking repeatedly due to their aggression and their large fangs. And for this reason, people are strongly advised not to approach them. Chances of being bitten are high if encountered. There is at least one recorded case of a small child dying within 15 minutes of a bite from a Sydney funnel web spider. For very small children, the amount of venom dispersed throughout the body is many times the concentration in an adult. Fortunately, since the anti-venom was developed in 1980, there have been no recorded fatalities from Sydney funnel web spider bites. But it's still a good idea to be cautious. Number 7. The Northern Funnel Web Spider. The northern funnel web spider of Australia is the largest of this genus, reaching sizes over three inches long and is most easily distinguished by its habit of dwelling in trees. So three inches, and where does it dwell? Australia. And in trees. In trees. Oh, in Australia. In Australian. Isn't it funny how we say Australian? These spiders are attracted to water and often fall into swimming pools, leading to encounters with homeowners trying to scoop them out of the water. The venom from all funnel web spider species can kill a human within minutes if no anti-venom is available. They carry the toxin called atracotoxins, which we just talked about, and exposure to this toxin might result in the goosebumps, sweating, tingling around the mouth and tongue, twitching, salivation, watery eyes, elevated heart rate, and elevated blood pressure. Okay. So, name five symptoms of the bite. Twitching. Salivation. Heart rate. Heart rate. Heart rate. Heart rate. Sweating. They have elevated heart rate or blood pressure. Watery eyes. I'm probably going to be awful later. And the 
Salvation. Salvation. Not salvation. No? Salvation. Salvation. Like salvation, but with an I between the L and the B. A lot of things. The final stages of severe envenomation include dilation of the pupils, uncontrolled generalized muscle twitching, unconsciousness, elevated intracranial pressure, and death. This itself makes the funnel web spider one of the most dangerous and poisonous spiders in the world. Number six, the Chilean recluse. The Chilean recluse spider is a venomous spider closely related to the brown recluse spider. This spider is considered by many to be the most dangerous of the recluse spiders, and its bite is known to frequently result in severe systemic reactions, including death. As suggested by its name, this spider is not aggressive and usually bites only when pressed against human skin, such as when putting on an article of clothing. Like all recluse spiders, the venom of the Chilean recluse contains the dermonocrotic agent, which is otherwise found only in a few pathogenic bacteria. Some bites are minor with no necrosis, but a small number of bites have produced severe dermonocrotic lesions or even systemic conditions, sometimes resulting in renal failure. In about 4% of cases in a clinical study in Chile, the victims actually died. Number 5. The Six-Eyed Sand Spider The Six-Eyed Sand Spider is a medium-sized spider with a body measuring 1 to 2 inches and legs spanning up to 4 inches. It is found in deserts and other sandy places in southern Africa with close relatives found in both Africa and South America. In southern Africa, there's something crazy about a, an experiment they did with these. I don't know if you'll catch it, but I was trying to picture how it went down. It was working. It is a cousin to the recluses, which are found worldwide. Due to its flattened stance, it is also sometimes known as the six eyed crab spider. Bites by this spider to humans are uncommon, but have been experimentally shown as lethal to rabbits within five to 12 hours. Yeah, I'm trying to understand. They went in how do you experimentally find out that a rabbit dies in five to 12 hours after? Well, you go and you get it bit, and then you yeah. see some sweat. Well, that weird. kind of reminds me of the bad guy in Monsters Incorporated. Remind me. Sorry. Remind me. Like, how does it remind you of that? Oh, wait, what it looks like? Yeah, oh, looks like I thought you meant the whole yeah, using rabbits. That's the whole using rabbits. They're like crab guys. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah, that's a good point. So they just like stole some bunnies. Oh, no, not the animals. <laughs> Now take the bunnies, yeah. let them get bit okay. by a six-sided okay. sand spider. Let's see how long it takes. Yeah. And it's the not like multiple rabbits. Rabbits yeah. is plural. Yeah. 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 How many yeah. rabbits? Yeah. Thank you. There are no confirmed bites and only two suspected ones on record. However, in one of these cases, the victim lost an arm to massive necrosis, and in the other, the victim died of massive hemorrhaging, similar to the effects of a rattlesnake bite. Toxicology studies have demonstrated that the venom is particularly potent with a powerful hemolytic and necrotoxic effect, causing blood vessel leakage, thinning of the blood, and tissue destruction. Number four, the brown recluse. The brown recluse spider, also known as violin spiders, fiddlers, or fiddlebacks, Fiddleback spider. I heard another one. What was it? Fiddle spider? You know what a brown recluse looks like, right? You can. It actually looks like it has. It's a violin, but I can't, it looks like a guitar to me. It literally looks like it has an actual guitar on its back. It looks like a spider. My mom thought I got bit by a brown recluse, but I think it was just one of those stone spiders. So it turns out very few people are actually allergic to their venom in the sense that it would eat away at their flesh. Most people, you're just going to get that little pimple like I told you about. And you might have one on your arm or like on your thigh, and you're like, random pimple. And then you're like, wait, that's actually brown recluse. What were you going to say? Has anyone here ever been bit by a brown recluse? I mean, it's, it's just random pimples. <laughs> the Where was it? Did it eat away at the, your flesh? It was right here. 
but mom, she got bit by one because I told you one time it went on her finger and like yeah. she had like a hole in her finger. Really was crazy. it in your house? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? The doctor said I got bit by one, but I didn't see it. it. My knee literally swelled up to this size. Oh my word. And it was like not good. Not good. Okay. From the dark violin shaped marking on the head are slow moving retiring spiders that wander about in dim areas. They often den in footwear, clothing, and beds and are then easily trapped against someone's skin by clothing, bed sheets, and the like, leading to the spider's bite. Most encounters with this spider occur from moving boxes or rooting about in closets or under beds. The range of the brown recluse in the U.S. is mostly restricted to the Midwest, South, and Southeast, like in my hometown of Tucson. However, a number of related recluse spiders are found in Southern California and nearby areas as well. The bite of a brown recluse is extremely venomous and has led to fatalities through massive tissue loss and the subsequent infection. Sadly, fatalities from brown recluse spiders have been reported only in children younger than seven years of age. Number three, the brown widow. Now, I'm pretty sure nobody's heard of this one. The brown widow spider, like its cousins, the black widow, redback spider, and katipo are spiders that carry a neurotoxic venom, which can cause a set of symptoms known as latrodectism. Like many spiders, widows have very poor vision and they move with difficulty when they're not on their web. The brown widow spiders have relatively spindly legs and deep globular abdomens. The abdomen has one or several red spots, either above or below. The spots may take form of an hourglass or several dots in a row. The male widows, like most spider species, are much smaller than the females and may have a variety of streaks and spots on a browner, less globular abdomen. The males are generally less dangerous than the females, but will bite if the web is disturbed and the spider feels threatened. The venom of a brown widow, while seldom life-threatening, produces very painful effects, including muscle spasms, tetanus-like contractions, and in some cases, spinal or cerebral paralysis. This paralysis is generally temporary, but might lead permanent damage to central nervous system. A serious bite will often require a short hospital stay. Children, elderly, and ill individuals are at most risk of serious effects. Now it's time for the day's best day. Today we're going to be looking at an exceptionally beautiful spider, but never let its looks fool you. Although this species of tarantula is very popular in the pet trade, better make sure to look but not touch because it packs a venom that will surely ruin your day. Number two, the fringed ornamental tarantula. Fringed, that's how you fringe your shirt or your jeans. Fringed. And then ornamental, like an ornament on a Christmas tree, tarantula, tar and chula. Oh, I thought the ornamental because it sounded like, like a little Asian. Oh, that's what I think. I don't think so. <laughs> Are you thinking oriental? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
See, I learned when we, my parents adopted two girls from China. People are Asian, things are Oriental. Like you can have an Oriental rug or like an Oriental teacup. Anyways, moving on. The fringed ornamental tarantula is a large and stunning species with the ability to reach over 10 inches, some reporting 12. It is quite a sight to behold indeed. It is suggested that this species is enjoyed for viewing and you should really know what you're doing if you attempt to pick or hold one. A single bite from this tiny spider will earn you a trip to the local hospital. Although there has never been a recorded death from any tarantula bite, this species is considered to have a medically significant bite with venom that may cause intense pain and extreme muscle cramping. Intense pain, extreme muscle cramping. And what, how, how big is this? 10 to 12 inches. So literally, like, think about that. A lot of tarantulas eat birds because they're so big. Imagine if one tooth would bite you though. Like how big it would be on your arm. It's like just big, isn't it? Judging from the experience of keepers bitten by this species, they move rapidly and although they generally prefer flight to fight, may attack when cornered. For instance, in a recent incident reported in the journal Toxicon, which is an excellent resource for those interested in venom and venomous creatures, a man in Switzerland was bitten on the finger while feeding his pet tarantula. He felt little pain at the time, but experienced hot flashes two hours later. Within 15 hours, he was hospitalized with muscle spasms and chest pain. He was treated with muscle relaxers, but muscle cramps continued for an additional three weeks. I see the best for last, but first, I have a quick challenge that takes only five seconds to complete. If you can leave a like and subscribe within the next five seconds, Brazilian wandering spider is a. It's the Brazilian wandering spider. Brazilian wandering spider. Brazilian wandering. A large brown spider, similar to North American wolf spiders, but bigger and possessing a more toxic venom. It has the most neurologically active venom of all spiders and is regarded as the most dangerous spider in the world. Brazilian wandering spiders are active hunters and travel a lot. They tend to crawl into cozy, comfortable places for the night and sometimes crawl into fruits and flowers that humans consume and cultivate. If the spider has a reason to be alarmed, it will bite in order to protect itself. But unless startled or aggravated, most bites will be delivered drier without venom. Venom bites will occur if the spider is pressed against something or hurt. So it's only really and they have found where people will go into Walmart or something like that, and they'll reach over to get like a watermelon or cantaloupe out of the big wooden bins. And when they go to get it, the spiders will be in there because they live amongst the fruit. No more watermelon. No more watermelon. <laughs> in this case, the high levels of serotonin contained in the venom will deliver a very painful bite that can result in muscle shock. Occasional deaths have occurred even after anti-venom treatment. Children are more sensitive to the bites of wandering spiders as the spiders often make threat gestures, such as raising up their legs or hopping sideways on the ground, which might entice a curious child. Children have weaker immune systems as well, and even if anti-venom is quickly administered, death can occur within minutes after the bite. Which venomous spider are you most fascinated by? I'd say adult. Um, you're not going to get bitten by one of these spiders. I guarantee it. That's not wood. Okay, friends. I need to come around and take that up. It, well, hold on. Let me ask this. Did you, was there one you missed you need me to give you the answer to? Was there one that you kind of didn't quite catch? It's okay. I, can, I don't mind helping. Can you do the challenge? Yeah, right. Oh, man.
Okay. And we're moving on. Let's talk just for a quick second about centipedes and millipedes. And so that is going to be specifically these two classes. So can you guys remind me what kingdom we're in? That's right. So kingdom animalia. Let's put that up here. Why does that blue one not work? Kingdom animalia. What phylum are we in? Remember, we went with phylum um, arthropoda, we did class crustacea, and we did class arachnida, and we did class, um, well, now we're doing the centipedes and millipedes. But let's look at these two words. So now we're in class, some people say chelopoda, and some people say chelopoda. I don't know which one's correct. But this one has to do with the centipedes. And diplopoda has to do with the millipedes. So, that's it. Centipedes and millipedes. So let's talk about centipedes first. Centipedes are the ones that can be really freaky and venomous. So a centipede is very flat. Now a guy in Hawaii found one that was like a foot long and he mounted it on his wall. I mean, this big, okay. So when I was in Lanai, which is off the island of Maui, all of us, all of my friends, we were eating dinner and then we walked back to the bus So the sun was kind of coming down and the girl in front of me jumps to the side of the sidewalk, grabs her leg and starts screaming. And I saw something like dart into the bushes. And we were like, what is it? What is it? What is it? <laughs> and anyways, her leg was so red. You saw these two little like marks in her leg. And she had to stay in the hotel room for days because she was so sick from it. And it was a centipede bite. So they're disgusting. Like it looks kind of like you have these two um, antennae and then like these pinchers. And then each segment has just one leg coming off each side. So centipede, they basically say they have hundreds of legs, but really they don't have hundreds of legs. I mean, they have a lot of legs, but not a hundred. And they're very flat. I think I have the picture of a freaky one on my phone. Freaky centipede coming up. First, I'm going to show. So, freak centipede. Freak centipede. Have you ever seen one of these? I'm sure you've seen one little. Oh, they kind of don't do that. Oh, my life just flashed. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So they're very flat, one leg on each side, so two per segment. And millipede, what does milli mean? Nope. It means a thousand. But here's the interesting thing. They ne no, there's not even a single millipede they've ever found that has a thousand legs. I think the most they found was 750. So these have two pairs of uh, legs per segment. So it would look like this. You know what a roly poly looks like? Yeah. You know how it has a more rounded back where the centipede's like flat? The millipede looks like a roly poly. It kind of has that rounded hump back, but it's longer. And if it was on you, it would feel like a thousand legs walking on you. But really, this is more um, like this. Each segment would have two pairs. See that? So it's not really a thousand, they're more rounded and they have two pairs of legs per segment. And that's all you need to know about that. So now we're gonna talk about insects. I'll have a race too soon. Can you even see? Do you wanna, where can I let you sit to be girl safe? Can't see the board this way, can you? Okay. So let's talk about insects. How many 
legs did a spider have? Eight. How many legs does an insect have? Six. Okay, so these are the things you learned in six, uh, third grade that you should still be hearing with you. So class insecta, let's just start with the simple six legs or in parentheses, three pairs. Now, think of an insect, head, thorax, abdomen, or cephalothorax, abdomen. Think of an ant. They have a head, thorax, and abdomen. So they're very separated out like that. Okay, compound eyes. What was the spider's simple eye like? A straw, so just like one simple lens. What's a compound eye? It's going to have multiple lenses, so multiple views, like a kaleidoscope. So, um, of the same of the same image. All right. Most insects will have. Wings. Have you guys ever held a butterfly and the powdery substance on the wings come off? And even beneath that powdery substance is like a translucent wing with veins. It looks like veins going through it. And they say if the powder comes off the butterfly, it, it won't live. Although I will say, I read that most butterflies die within 14 days of coming out of their cocoon. And I think to myself, that's so much work. Like all <laughs> the caterpillar eating and the cocooning and all of that just for 14 days. Yeah. So they can have scale-like wings. They can have leather wings. They can have wings that have spikes on them. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of different kinds of wings. What about antennae? Yes. Yes. So they have one pair of antennae. And then let's explain that because there's some that have more than one pair. Um, which ones are you thinking of that have more than one pair? I'm trying to think of any at all. I'm sure there's always an exception to the rule, but in terms of like classifying, you see how why they classify. Like they, if they found something, like we take for granted that we all know what an insect is, but at the time, like why, why wouldn't I think that that's a spider versus an insect? So they really just came up with ways to classify. Like we just basically say insects will have one pair of antennae. Now, I bet you there's outliers. Okay, what would be the difference between these two things. Um, I don't know what I'm doing right now. I'm going to write this word down here. Okay, complete versus incomplete metamorphosis. What does this word mean? Morph, change. You ever seen the matrix? Mm -hmm. What's the guy's name in it? Morpheus. So morph, I think in chemistry, a triangle represents the word change. Morph means to change. So if I look at complete metamorphosis, I'm saying it is a complete change. So if I look at an egg that becomes a, um, a pupa, that becomes a larvae, that becomes an adult, did I switch those up? I feel like I switched those up. I think I did. I need to double check that. Because that's going to bother me. Yeah, because this is when it's cocooning. So switch those two. Sorry about that. The egg to the larvae, which would be the caterpillar, Compared to what the adult looks like, can you see why it's a complete change? So incomplete obviously means it's not a complete change. So what they call that is egg, nymph, adult. And this word really is like a mini me. Which have you ever seen a baby um, grasshopper? They're really tiny. They're actually really cute. So that's like a mini me baby caterpillar. Grasshopper that's going to become the daddy grasshopper. So it's just a tiny version of itself. All right. Go ahead and look in your book and you can share if you want to.
page 382. I just want to make sure. I want you to see this. There's two more words I'm going to give you that I want you to be responsible for. There's two things. I don't see spiracles listed on that drawing, but just follow me. Find a little right to the center, the word malpigian tubules. So it's on the bottom, a little right of center. Do you see it? Okay. If I said to you, malpigian tubules, this is page 382, malpigian tubules do the same thing that the green glands did in the crawfish. Do you remember there was like two lentils with the stringy ganglia going in between it? What would they, what would that mean that it does? What do the green Cleans glands do? The blood. Cleans the blood. Which what what we, do we use as humans to do that? Heart. heart? The heart will pump it, but what will clean it? The liver? Uh well, technically. Uh -huh. Technically, yes. But keep going. It's you know what urine is? Okay. Let's make sure you understand that. When you eat anything with protein, and it's gonna be in plants, it's gonna be in, in animal meat, the protein in, actually creates something in your blood called urea, U-R-E-A. And the kidneys are filtering the urea out from what you ate. Because if we want all the good stuff that was in that animal meat, we want all the good stuff that's in the beans or whatever protein we're getting, but the urea has to come out. It's just protein that comes out? Yeah, so urea isn't protein. So then the urea becomes urine. Yeah, follow me? So that's cleaning the blood. Yeah, so crawfish have green glands, but insects have malpigian tubules. And these tubules actually just work to clean the blood. It's right there actually past the stomach. So that's one part you need to know the word for. But the other thing is, let's just say like I'm a grasshopper and this is my ventral side. What side is the ventral side for a grasshopper? The side next to the ground or the side facing the sky? What's the ventral side? The ground. the ground. So it's always like the abdominal side. Now imagine I have all these tiny little holes all over my ventral side. Are you visualizing it? Those tiny little holes are called spiracles and they are used for breathing, for gas exchange. So each of those holes allows oxygen in, carbon dioxide out. So let me write that first. Tiny. Ventral, that's part of it, but they have to have a way to get the air to the tracheas. You see what I'm saying? Because they don't go, <sighs> like they're not just like taking like big, deep gulps of breath. So, what's interesting is what would happen if I took like coconut oil and rubbed it all over the front of me? What would happen to those little, <laughs> yeah, what, what would happen to all those little holes? All those little holes would clog up. And you die. And you would die. And you would die. <laughs> so if you go and you spray insecticide, you're spraying like basically coconut oil on the insect because what it's doing is clogging up their spiracles so they can't breathe. So they're suffocating to death. So what I want to do right now is come around and get your insect informational page if you brought it today.
It's beautiful. Okay. So let's go through these really quick, and then we're going to go over the test questions that you're taking this week. I hate when you sit down and the chair goes, shh. So not good. Yeah, I don't like that. All right. Listen, Linda, we're going to do yellow jackets first. Anybody here ever stepped on a yellow jacket or been stung by a yellow jacket? It's not a, it's not fun. That's really dangerous. If you get stung and you mix baking soda with water, it makes a paste, put it on it, and it actually draws the uh, venom out. Yeah. And my daughter's a big whiner. And so she was running through the yard. She's like, eee. And then I was like, stop whining. And then I look at, she's got two bloody spots on her leg and like they're all swollen up and all that. And I, yeah, mom of the year. <laughs> yeah, being a mom is, it's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> Because I broke my arm, and then a week later, after I got my cast off, I broke my foot. And then a week, I mean, a week or two weeks after I got my cast off, but I got We It sounds like we all need therapy. Really okay, fun. so yellow jackets found North America, Mexico, England, but they're mostly in the southeast United States, hence where we live. They have chewing mouth parts, they eat fruit and tree sap, they live in colonies. If they're left undisturbed, they can reach basketball size, like the actual nest. Oh. <laughs> okay. They are actually a wasp and not a bee, as many people believe, and they don't leave their stinger in you when they sting, and they will sting you multiple times. Like, jaw, jaw, like over and over. Sorry about that. Okay. Yellow jacket, oh yellow jacket, where are thou, yellow jacket? Your sting is like poison in my veins. One leaves, many follow. You corrupt my soul. You make life like a tornado, spinning around in circles, destroying everything. Good job. Sorry. I'm going to. No one knows which one is yours. Plus the way I do inflection, it makes it sound better than it is. All right, listen. Honeybee, you can hear Joshua. Is mine? He did bed bugs. Oh, bed bugs. <laughs> bed bugs bite my toes. They even crawl up my nose as they hunt for blood. There you go. That's a haiku, right? Five seven five. Okay. So I think it's five seven. So honeybees. Do you guys remember, and maybe you don't, but there was a time that you could go to Charlie Daniels Park or all these different places, and for sure, especially in the summer, but maybe more in the spring too, you would see bees on all the little white flowers out in the grass. Like you would be walking and for sure you were going to run into that. Has anyone else noticed that over the years that has happened less and less and less and dwindled? It's because there's a serious threat to honeybee population, which they're really important. Um, we actually have a beehive in our backyard. So honeybees. I don't do anything with it. Slavic does it. I don't know what's How'd you know that? Really? I don't even remember that. I just remember he was in a robe and it was, I didn't understand. Okay. Back to Miss Jennifer. Everybody look at me. Thank you. Okay. Honey and wax from honeybees have been used by humans for thousands of years. They're extremely important to human survival and without them, crops would suffer and we'd have a lot less food. Okay, sorry. Stop texting me because then people on there are reading it. Stop. Okay. Um, oh, wait, I'm not sharing my screen. You didn't see it. Okay. The honeybee is the official state insect of North Carolina. They have chewing and sucking mouth parts. Their source of food is pollen and nectar. They're herbivores. They are considered a beneficial insect, although they can be harmful if they sting you. Um, bees are very special. Wait, that's not the poem. Wait. I, you're fine. 
But look how pretty that is. I'll, I'll take it. All righty. The devil, shush, kebab. The devil's flower mantis. These things are so like weird looking. They remind me of like the bad guy grasshopper from A Bug's Life is what they look like to me. And they have like these big picture things like on the top. Okay, devil's flower man mantis. It lives in Africa. It chews. It gets stressed out easily. And when it does, it runs away and bumps into everything and shows its colors. If they bite you, they might draw your blood, but that's it. <laughs> um, did you write that? <laughs> I don't think I can. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> but if you find a mantis in your home, it means that angels are watching over you. No. <laughs> yep. Okay. So when we, when I used to wait tables, I lived up in, do you know where Suwannee is? It's the mountain between Nashville and Chattanooga. So I waited tables up there and one night, I look on the wall and there was already like a mural on the wall of like trees and stuff. And I see this thing and I kid you not, it was like this wide and like that big. And I had to look like a couple times because I thought it was painted onto the mural, but it was a Luna moth. And I was wanting to get a broom and like go at it. And they, everyone's like, no, they're like, you have to protect them and all that. So it was legit and I'm not kidding you. Well, I didn't say it got that big. Well, mine did. <laughs> it did. I'm not making it up. Okay. Luna moth found in North American countries. It doesn't, it's neutral to humans in the environment. They live in forests, gardens, backyards, parks, and where Miss Jennifer waited tables. Luna moths do not have any mouth parts because they get all the nutrients they need as caterpillars. Um, I'm going to read the poems. <laughs> Green and purple wings flying over the tall trees. The Luna Moth <laughs> Good job. No, it was good. This is my favorite one. Because the assassin bug is like nasty. Okay. Plus your drawing's amazing. But the assassin bug, they call it the kissing disease because these bugs will kiss, kiss, bite you around the soft, fleshy parts of your mouth. I think you have yeah. your mouth. Like you would let them. Like, I, I saw a lot of research that said, like, when I searched them up, it said kissing them, and I kept trying to see if there was something there. Yeah. Because they were like a ton of different sexes. Yeah. So, so a lot of people got the Chagas disease. I, I might, I don't even know if that's the same as Zika virus now that I think about it. But all I, the point is, they bite you, and in that open wound, because they have their feces on their feet. Oh. Their feces have bacteria in it that get in you and give you chagas disease. How, how do they get up through your mouth? That's just the thing. Where they sleep? I don't know. I don't think, I don't want to think about it. Okay. <laughs> so they're predators. They live in a variety of habitats, including the rainforest. They consume creatures much larger than themselves and stab their prey with their proboscis, injecting venom into the body. They're not a state insect. There's the pale green assassin, the leafhopper assassin, the milkweed assassin, the wheel bug assassin. Okay. And I didn't add a poem because I completely That's fine. They're all worth five points a piece, right? Okay. The cicada. This is something that gives my children nightmares. They hate the cicada bugs. But there was just their casing, right? It wasn't the actual bug. So it wasn't just the, the molting. What do you got? I will say that I'm a kid, and it's still enough because you can make them busy by doing that. That's 
funny. See, they came up from underneath the kids' um, swing set, and there were all these holes in the ground and like the empty, weird carcasses of them. And there was some weird thing where Vanderbilt was trying to find white-eyed cicadas to study. So they had said, if anyone can find a white-eyed cicada, they would give you like a thousand dollars so that they could study it. And I was always like looking like trying to find a white-eyed cicada. A white-eyed? Yeah. yeah. Or it could have been a red-eyed. I don't remember. Yeah, then it was a white eye. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Cicadas live in North America. They go through incomplete metamorphosis. They make such loud noises that it can actually damage your ears. That's true. There are many myths about cicadas. One of them is that a W on its wing means that war is coming. That's interesting. They eat sap from trees. It's a cicada. I can't do my If it has some red eyes and wings, assault your ears. They do assault your ears. Praying mantis, native to Asia, 20 different species. They eat flies, butterflies, moths, termites, etc. They live in gardens, forests, vegetation, warm temperatures. They're predators. They sit on tall grass for better views. Only the males can fly. They drink dew from leaves. It's a peaceful relationship between the human and the mantis. And they're regarded as a spiritual connection with the underworld. We're getting close, and then I gotta do this test thing. Praying mantis. Oh, okay. okay, devil's flower mantis. This is the one that has like imagine like a weird okay the cephalothorax no the thorax coming to this point. It's kind of like a triangle, and then from that this long stalk with like a it's helicopter. Wow. It doesn't look like it should be a real an or. Each of those. Uh, good question. The, like little globes at the end of the helicopter thing. It disguises itself as a flower. It has a chewing mouth part. Some people keep devil flower mantises as pets. They like to eat flies and its habitat consists of flowers and plants. Idolo mantis turning into a flower, eating a few flies. That's really good. You know what, who's this, this one? Okay, it didn't have a name on it. I want to make sure I remember that. <clears throat> okay, so I love the monarch butterfly. And this is Alabama state insect. They are seen as a symbol of foretelling and spiritual transformation. They are not harmful to humans, beneficial. They even pollinate wildflowers. They camouflage under their wings to make them look like dried wing, uh, leaves. Excuse me. Um, they live in open fields and meadows. When crawling caterpillars, they will chew their food, but once they get wings, they start flying and they have to drink their food. They feed on nectar, complete metamorphosis, which you guys know. Beautiful, mon wait, beautiful monarch, flies to the south in winter, each year for warmth. Good job. Do you know monarchs have to drink blood from their visitors? Really Where do you find you this information? I don't know. <laughs> Like I just saw like a video of like a whole bunch of them on like a dead fish. Okay, so this is the doodle bug. Oh, the doodle bug. That sounds like something in a cartoon. I think it is. I think it is something in a cartoon. So they live in a pit of sand and they make tunnels. And it goes towards the pit and insects fall into those pits and the ant lion, that's another name for the doodle bug, quickly captures and eats it by injecting enzymes and dissolving its tissues and sucking the nutrients out. Ant lions are harmless and cause no damage to flowers. People are structures. They are highly beneficial and feed on ants and other insects that fall into their traps. It was a mythical ant lion hybrid written about in a second century physiologus, I guess that's a book, where animal descriptions were paired with Christian morals. The ant lion was described as starving to death because of its dual nature, the lion nature of the father could only eat meat and the ant half from the mother could only eat grain. Thus the offspring could not eat either and would starve. And they paired it with Matthew 5, 37. That's really cool. I didn't even know that. Oh, did you say Wikipedia? Don't ever say that word to me again. Um, isn't it pretty? And these are the tunnels. 
-hmm. Okay. Okay. These are this is good. Antlion, antlion, come out of your pit, deceive your prey, and then capture it. From egg to larva to cocoon, then adult, you are the most vicious predator of them all. You wait, then attack, and viciously eat. All insects are terrified of your dunes of deceit. Oh. Really was good, wasn't it? Okay. You're from the other class. What I'm going to do is pass out the test questions, and you guys are going to go around and answer them one at a time. I'll help you come up with the answer if you don't know it. And this is the way that you're going to be prepared. So this is like a practice. I just told you, and I need my dad for a visual. I don't have my book. You said I have to buy, like, you change the store. What happened? You need to go to the wire on the bar. There's only a few. I'm going to eat three. You're welcome. Maybe I'm just going to eat it. going to be okay. All right, people, I will help you come up with the answer. But the goal is that each of you would benefit from hearing the question and the answer. So when you take the test, you'll go, I think I remember she said blank. So this is the time that you don't check out and think about what you're going to eat for lunch and what you're going to say to her and all things. Focus. You got it? Focus. So and I'll repeat the question so everyone can hear it. But would you, if you have a multiple choice, you need to read it and tell us before A, B, C, D. So don't stress. Okay, would you mind reading that first one? So which of these following terms is not associated with sponges? A, collar, gel, B, A, B, C, D, C, D. Okay, so. Collar cell, medusa, spicules, spongin. Which one of those is not about a sponge? Medusa. So medusa is the jellyfish. The collar cell is what the sponge uses to eat. Remember, it looked like a badminton birdie. It has like a net, and it kept all the food that's stuck in that net. That's how it eats. Okay. Um, would you mind reading your other one? This is an extra credit one. Explain the difference between the compound and the simple hydrogen. Anybody? Do you know it? Compound and simple eyes. What is it? Compound is like where they have like multiple eyes inside the eye, but simply for all those. Yep. There you go. Simple. Dalton. Which of the simple animals have body senses? Okay, this one's hard. I'm going to ask you the simplest animal with body symmetry. Remember the body symmetries where it's like bilateral and then radial and then spherical, but that one's easy. Now, here are these organisms, and don't answer until you've really thought about it. Tell us the four options. A, sponges, B, earthworms, C, spinded nereus. Nidarian, C, silent. D, babyfish. Okay, so go all the way back to Kino and Mela at the very beginning, and I introduced sponges. Then we went to jellyfish. Then we went to earthworms. Then we went to flatworms. And then we went to tapeworms. And then we went to crawfish. And then we went to ant spiders. And then we went to insects. But if we went all the way back to the simplest organism, the sponge, did the sponge have any type of body symmetry? No, it was the only animal we say doesn't have body symmetry because they, they, you can't really truly divide them in any way because they're all so different. But then, what's, so what's the next one? Yeah. Okay, 
stay with me, stay with me, but don't tune in to where I am because I'm, I'm in it. Like I'm here for this. So sponges do not have body symmetry. So the question is asking, what is the simplest animal to have body symmetry? Sponges, out. What was the next thing we studied? Jellyfish. Jellyfish. Jellyfish love story and costume pools and it's released their egg in the spare and then they have baby, then it makes the jellyfish ice cream cone. Does anyone, <laughs> did anybody actually watch my recorded video? <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, thanks for the honesty. Well, I just turned up the speed like three. <laughs> <laughs> the point being, cnidarians, jellyfish, and sea anemones are the simplest organisms to have bodies. And you know what kind that is, by the way? Oh. Radial. Radial, yes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> That's going to be painful. <laughs> I'm scared. Read so, me the next one. Jellyfish <laughs> Oh, what's your job? Oh. What are book lungs? They're lungs that look like books. Okay, so they're spiders, a spider's way of breathing. That's a good way to say it. Yeah, only a spider has this one. They're Yeah, just layered back, 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 back. Okay, read me a question, Ben. And I tell you the label, the helipad, the abdomen, and um, the antennules, and then just circle the cephalothorax. So that's pretty simple. Go ahead. Uh, I have a two part. What type of circulatory system does the crayfish have? And that's uh, open, right? Okay, so it's open. It's internally bleeding all the time. What kind of circulatory system do you have? Closed. Closed. It's in the vessel. Don't ever let someone tell you blood is blue. Can you please promise me that anytime you hear that, you'll just be like, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to think so that. No, no, no. Why is it, yeah? That's about it? light absorption, and now you're getting into some weird chemistry, weird earth science, geology stuff. I don't know the answer to. But I do know that blood is not blue inside your body. What's the reason why they tell you it's blue and then what happens? Oxygen. So here's my question. What does blood carry? Oh, oxygen. Yeah. What does blood carry? Okay. So, what? That's oh, yeah. Nelson. Who came up with that? Yeah, well, then how did we find out? Magic school. Magic school. Magic school. 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 Yeah. Yeah. school. Oh, yeah. Inside, the, they were inside the little blood cell yeah. and everything. Right. It's like chocolate. They were like, it's actually blue in your life. You know why they did that? I know why they did that. Because when you look at, um, like, if you get the frog, they'll inject it with wax. 
So they'll inject red wax into all of the arteries because they're full of blood coming away from the heart. So that blood has a lot of oxygen. They'll inject the veins of blue wax, just so you have the visual idea of these are the veins that are taking the blood back to the heart to get more oxygen. But there's no such thing as blood without oxygen. So will the majority of the test be on multiple choice? There's 10 multiple choice, a bunch of short answer, and one label. Is this the one I had? Yes. yes. And how can you tell if, the, if it is a male or female fish? They have uh, the little tiny swimmerette things, and the, the first two will be bigger. That's right. right. On a male, the swimmerette, the first two are huge, and the rest are small. On a female, they're all the same size. Okay. Explain the two functions of the fictitious swimmerettes. Okay, what are the two functions of a fictitious swimmerette? Now, you know. Well, guess the first one just based on its name, Slim Moret. Slim. It's literally moving around. They literally just use them to swim around. So just movement. The other one is they use it for reproduction. So they'll like carry their babies on it, carry their eggs on it. It's for reproduction. So Slim Moret's movement, reproduction. And what crayfish organ is used to clean the blood? What, what organ in the crawfish cleans blood? Do you know? It's like lentils. Green glands. So it's like two little lentils and then the two strings between there are the game with them. All right, what's another one? I gave you a lot, sorry about that. This is a multiple choice. Rotworms have two eye spots that are capable of seeing in black and white only, detecting light, or seeing oh, no sight at all, or seeing images in no color, but it's very close. You know? Detecting light. That's right. So the, remember the, the goofy looking flatworms, the eyes like super close together? These are for detecting light. That's it. They can't see color. They can't see black and white. They just see light. That's it. Okay. Are we going to do all yours? Okay. Gotcha. Um, so I say, give me an example. You're going to get this not right. And then you're like, how did you teach me that? And I'm going to say, but I said it in class. And then you're like, I don't remember that. And I'll say, I have it recorded. That's what I'm going to say. So I forgot I was recording, actually. So tell me, she's going to do it, but the question is, give me an example of an invertebrate with bilateral symmetry. See it? Literally, can you cut it in half and get two mirror images? Yeah, so bilateral symmetry, so butterfly. That's a great answer. I'm so smart. Okay, what's the next one? Give one example of an invertebrate with radials. Yeah, or old. Yeah. You could say put a bilateral, it could be a grasshopper, it could be a spider, it could be an earthworm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, multiple choice. Do you need me to like scan it? Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, read the question. Food enters a flatworm's body cavity through a muscular tube called. So, food enters the flatworm's body through the muscular tube called the. A. Flagella. B. Pharynx. <laughs> C. Ganglion. D. Or D. Nematode. Okay. How did the food get into the body? Pharynx is a powerful suction muscle. It's in the earthworm and the flatworm. Ganglia means brain. Okay, so the pharynx, you guys remember the picture where it was like this, two weird eyes, and then coming out of it is this weird vacuum thing it has, and it literally can suck in dirt from water. Okay, any other questions you have? Okay, yours. Earth, in earthworms, food is grown into small pieces in, in the A crop, B gizzard, C pharynx, or D esophagus. Where is food ground up? G for grind, G for gizzard. Grind in the gizzard. Gizzard grindage. Grinding in the gizzard. G, G. Don't forget it. Okay, what about the crop? Since we're talking about it. The crop starts with a C 
closet starts with a C, what do you put, do with the closet? Close store the things. So, crab is for storage. Any other questions you have? The bristle like structures on some annelids' bodies. Annelid means are for. Keep going, I'm sorry. Are called A setae, B suckers, D nephridia, nephridia, nephridia or D ganglia. What are those bristle like structures on the ventral side of an earthworm that anchor into the dirt pulp? Setae. It says C tay. Oh, C -tay. It makes me feel really southern. So C tay. Okay. Kind of sounds like a name. How does an open circulatory system differ from a closed circulatory system? What do you open, think? they like dumps the blood into the organ, closed, and go directly to the organ. Um, no, no, that's good. Open, it's blood internally bleeding, dumping blood in the body. Closed, mm -hmm. it stays in a vessel. So, but that answer works. You got another one? Spiders feed by, you want me to read up there? Just tell me the right answer. Spiders feed uh, by? Sucking up prey after it's been ripped apart by. It liquefies the prey and sucks it up. The easiest way to tell whether an octopod is an insect or a spider is to just say the answer. It's kind of slick. It's kind of slick, yeah. But if you look at a spider and an insect, the first thing you're going to do is count the legs. And then this one is just like a piece. Okay, so there's a part where I have a little picture and I asked you what phylum it's in. So you're gonna to need to be able to look at the picture. So she's got a little picture of an earthworm and a little picture of a flatworm. Do you know the phylum that the earthworm's in? Just pretend like you have an earthworm named Dina. So this is your earthworm. And then the flatworm, what do you eat your dinner on? What's the opposite of heaven? What's a good flavor for gum? Mint. Mint. What's the phylum? Platy helminthes, okay? Oh, that's the final question. I thought I get phone calls from parents. I, I, I was like, dang, I can't just stop recording and not re record it. Okay, you got yours? Yeah, All I right. have the same thing going off of hers. Okay, uh, tell me the animal and then we'll get it up here. The tapeworm. Okay, so the tapeworm is a weird, gross. You saw it in the intestine. This word is already to me it gives me PBD. Say it out loud. Did you watch SpongeBob? Wasn't there like a giant yeah. Nemo? Yeah. Okay, this is the tapeworm. Okay, what's the next one? A crawfish. Crawfish. It asks the phylum and the class. Now, first of all, what phylum are crawfish in? Arthropoda. And what class are crawfish in? Did anyone else watch SpongeBob? What, what was the name of the place too. where they made Krusty 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 Krusty. Yeah. Crusty Krab. Crusty Krab. So crustacea. Okay. Were you a big Sid the Science Kid fan? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. That's so, 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 so or wonder pets. All right, she's got another one. I'm sorry, I digress. We only have three minutes. Go ahead. The brown. Okay, phylum. Arthropoda. Arthropoda. And then class for spiders. Arachnida. Good. And jellyfish. Phylum. He said it, but he said the sea. And you don't say the sea. Right area. Okay. We're almost done. Three more questions. We're in the final stretch. Which body part is the What's the band aid that wraps around the earthworm that helps reproduction? Well, the platellum. Platellum, perfect. Okay, we need your. Oh, you have more. She has more. There's two more questions. You guys aren't leaving yet. You have two more minutes. I mean, we just got to get ready. No, you don't. Really? We have two books and walk. No. What digestive organ in an earthworm stores food? The crop. The crop. Yeah, that's being hermaphroditic. Earthworms still require a mate. No. no. Yes. Oh, what? It does? He, yeah, you didn't see me take the two markers oh. over here. Like, oh, oh. Yeah. Earthworms oh. might have egg and sperm inside of them, but they still need another earthworm. <laughs> why is the arthropod's growth potential limited by the exoskeleton? So, why is the arthropod's growth? Does it grow? Because of how heavy it is. Yes. We get so heavy. You guys aren't with me. Oh, we are not. I was going to do it because I was like, I think you are going to But um, the arthropod growth potential can't get too big, it's way too much to carry around. 
the exoskeleton. Four on the last one. Right, so how does it just oh, keep going? Like a bunch of Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 I'm sorry.